In our last video, we left off uh, at the Pine Grove Theater. And in this video, we want to look at a theater similar to that theater on the opposite end of town. This was at 1209 Griswold Street on the south side of the street, about where this building here is today. I don't have a picture of the Griswold Theater, nor have I ever seen a picture of the Griswold Theater, which I think is unusual since we have pictures of theaters that were much older. All I have is a few ads that they had for uh, the coming attractions, and I'll show you those. These ads were uh, put in the paper in the 1920s, 1930s. Uh, I'm not sure when the theater closed, but probably the late 1940s, early 1950s. We know that it because in May of 1951, the Civic Players of Port Huron took over the Griswold Street Theater. The group used to be called the Jack Pudding Civic Players, but in 1945, they changed their name to the Civic Players of Port Huron. Here are a couple of the stage play advertisements, the curtain call and dirty work. And here's a group photo, at least the majority of the group, uh, taken in 1939. And it looks like they took their art pretty seriously. Here's uh, an actor that was portraying Abraham Lincoln in makeup. But by 1954, they were no longer using that theater. The theater was being used for auctions, as you can see from these two advertisements. Well, that takes care of the Griswold Theater. And while we're on this side of town, I might mention a theater that uh, was out on uh, Griswold Road in Sparlingville. It was called the Star Theater. It wasn't like any theater that we had in Port Huron. This was uh, a unique theater in itself. It's set in a very rural setting in Griswold. And as you zoom in here, it looks like uh, it might be the remnants of the word star, but maybe not. Here's a better look at it. And I guess we can't really tell what was on that sign. I'm sure it was some type of advertisement for them. Uh, I know that after it was a theater, it was a rolling rink, and it got a lot of views from uh, that venue as well. It was owned by Alfred Hayes, who had a full-time job at Mueller Brass. In fact, he worked there 35 years. But as far as when it started and when it stopped being a theater or a rolling rink, I really have no idea. But I thought I would put this on the honorable mention list. There was another theater that was on the north end of Port Huron uh, that I had my doubts about that it even existed. I read this article here by John Kaysen and he uh, referred to it as the Orpheum Theater that was in Fort Gratiot at that time. And he gave a specific address, 2319 Gratiot Avenue. Because he gave such a specific address, I was pretty sure he was right, but I searched all the Times Herald archives and the earlier paper archives and couldn't find any advertisement for that theater. I was about ready to give up and I came across two things that verified that there was a theater there. The first one is this, this very small uh, article here uh, referring to the Orpheum Theater. The Orpheum Theater reopened Saturday night under the old management, William Wallace being manager. The other article was in the social gatherings of the paper and it says this, word was received from them last night that they had missed their train and they had arrived home this morning. Captain Slyfield, for a number of years, sailed the lakes as a master of the various boats, but for the past few years he has been engaged in the moving picture theater business in this city. For several years he operated the Arcade Theater on Military Street, and at the time of his death was proprietor of the Orpheum Theater at North End. So yes, Virginia, there was a theater in Fort Gratiot, on Gratiot that none of us ever knew about, or very few, I should say. Today, that theater would have been located right about here, almost under the bridge, at the southern end of the village of Fort Cratchit. 
Today, only one building remains that was there at that time, and we're lucky to still have that building. In this vintage photograph here, we can see where the Orpheum Theater was by the red arrow on the very end of that block. Also, we can see where the building that is still remaining today was at that time, uh, also by the arrow in this photograph here. We covered this block in video number 18, so you might want to go back and look at that for some additional information, but I do have uh, some photographs that I didn't have back then that I'll share with you in this video. The first photograph is this one here of Skimmin Drugstore. I thought it was unusual that this was the only uh, building in the block that was made of wood, the rest were all brick. I always enjoy looking closer at these photographs because sometimes you see something you might have missed. For example, here you see the U.S. mailbox. Remember when we had mailboxes on almost every corner? The angle on this photograph is pretty severe, but it does give you an idea of what that block looked like uh, as we're looking from Elmwood to uh, South. Here's the next photo, a great uh, photo of that block. And as we zoom in here, we'll just go along the, the sidewalk and see what there is to see. Notice everybody has their awnings, though. That second one there is Bean and Brown Grocery Store. Can't quite make out the next one. Looks like that fellow there is uh, loading or unloading crates. And that looks like a very early automobile parked against the curb, uh, which is in contrast to the one on the left-hand side of the photograph, which is uh, a horse and buggy. And as we scroll up here in that last building where the Orpheum Theater was, uh, we can see that there's a signage there with a letter. I wonder if that letter could possibly be an O for Orpheum. Perhaps. This photograph here gives you a good look at the north side, the Elmwood side of the uh, northernmost building. It was uh, the Skimmins uh, drugstore. But here it's the E.F. Hollis uh, Pharmacy. Remember when we were scrolling through the photo and we saw this one here, Bean and Brown, uh, on the awning? Well, in this photograph here, we have a great picture of the front of the store along with the staff of the store. I enjoy looking at these windows, how they've displayed them. In case you didn't realize that the Bean and Brown grocery store was in this building that still survives today. But there have been other things uh, along the years that was there. The one that uh, a lot of us remember is the Fort Cratchit trading post that was there. Well, here's a photograph I got from the Detroit Historical Society. Uh, shows a Fort Gratiot trading post. It leaves a signage. I'm not sure. It looks like they might have been out of business at that time. It looks like the windows are boarded up. And that could be because of what happened there, which is in this photograph right here of the Times Herald. The trading post is owned by Charlie Clark, and he was murdered at the post in 1979. The motive was robbery, and there were two men involved, and both were apprehended. The reason the newspaper referred to him as Old Charlie is because that's how everybody remembered him, Old Charlie at the trading post. And in this photograph, you can see him taking poor Old Charlie out. And then you can see the signage. Maybe we have what you need. Come in. Fort Gratiot Trading Post, new and used furniture. Yes, this building has had quite a history. Time goes by, things change. At one time, the centerpiece of the block becomes the only piece on the block. The next theater we want to look at, I almost forgot to include. Uh, it's downtown where the McMoran complex is today. The first block of that rectangle that included the McMoran complex used to be a park. And in this pictorial map from 1867, you can see where that park was. 
That's why the street just to the north of the, of the park was called Park Street. Later, I think it was called Andrew Murphy, and I think now it's called Superior. You can see how much uh, room the McMoran complex would take up on this map if it were there. But uh, we don't want to look at that whole complex area. We just want to look at the first two blocks of it. You can see in that second block behind the park, there were some houses there. But in this 1894 pictorial map, you no longer see the houses there. All you see is a livery. And my guess would be that there was a fire that pretty much turned, burned that block up, but that's just speculation on my part. There was a lot of empty space in that block and eventually the farmers would bring all their produce in and they would sell, for, uh, they'd set up their wagons in that block and they would sell from the, the wagons, much like a farmer's market might do today, except for the wagons. And that livery became a market building, which I believe was owned by the city. They decided they wanted to build an auditorium in that block but there was a problem according to this article here. It says, gentlemen, in laying out the lines for the foundations of the new auditorium, we find that the market building occupies about 20 feet of the north end of our lot. Having already let the contract for the completion of the building on or before the first day of August 1897, we are very anxious to get to work. We therefore would ask your honorable body to take immediate action as to the disposition of the building. Well, they must have worked it out because in November of 1897, they had the auditorium opening. And I'll let you read this at your leisure here. The folks of my generation remember this as the Porter and High School gym. And this is looking at uh, the back of the auditorium. And you can see even after the auditorium was built, the farmers still came in and sold their goods. You can see all the farmers wagons there. The auditorium, much like McMoran Auditorium years later, was very important to the city of Port Huron because of the many different things it could be used for. For example, long before Port Huron High School would hold their commencement exercises in the auditorium when it was the gym. We see here in this article, back in 1899, they held their commencement exercises there when it was just an auditorium. The auditorium was also used by politicians. In this uh, article here from 1899, you can see the election is now ratified. Formalities observed last night at auditorium. Congressman Week spoke, and many others told how the fight was won. Kids with horns made more noise than a circus. And politicians also had their banquets there. In this article from 1900, it says Republican Banquet. Nearly 1,000 enthusiastic people were present at the auditorium on Friday night. 1,000 people sounds like a lot until you read this article from the same year. The Bryan Meeting. Nearly 3,000 people packed the auditorium on Monday. Roller skating tonight with band and grand march at the auditorium. Amusement for all, whether skaters or not. Admission 15 cents. Plenty of good seats on main floor and in the balcony. At the auditorium Friday evening, there will be roller skating with band, races between Miss Carly Childs and local fast skaters, and match polo. Well, I'm not sure what match polo is, but I guess it would cost you 15 cents to find out. Auditorium opens for roller skating Friday and Saturday afternoons when instructions will be given to both ladies and gentlemen by Mr. Fred W. Null. Boxing is also pretty popular back uh, in the early 1900s. As uh, this article says, 15 rounds, Finn and Frederick at Auditorium on New Year's Day will be one of the best contests of the season. Here's something I didn't expect. Indoor baseball. The indoor baseball season will open at the auditorium on Thursday evening, at which time the Port Hurons and Fort Gratiots will play. Those two teams are part of the local league, as well as these two teams here. Last of the season indoor baseball, auditorium Thursday evening, March 9th. 
courtyards and bankers. But they also played uh, other cities as well. Owasso in Port Huron. Great game of indoor baseball at the auditorium. Wednesday evening, February 15th. And then uh, on Tuesday, they had uh, indoor baseball for Gratius and the Rappapos. Dancing after the game. So I imagine they got a lot of ladies watching the games. And last but not least, it was lease for a theater. For a theater, the Port Yarn Auditorium has been leased. Work of fitting it up for that use now in progress will still be available for other purposes. They had a wide variety of things that played at the theater, and we'll just take a look at a few of them. Uh, this first one here, of course, are 22 young ladies in full military uniform of white and gold. I'm sure that was quite the band. Here we have a giant quartet. McCandless, the greatest Negro violinist, William Randolph, the great pianist, and little Patty McCandless, the famous child singer. Well, that's three. I always thought a quartet had to have four, but I wonder if uh, the McCandless was any relation to the local McCandless who uh, played in uh, local venues such as uh, the Windermere Hotel and Pine Grove Park and so forth. Here we have a picture of that uh, orchestra. Or perhaps, uh, if not related, it was actually them. The Irish drama entitled St. Patrick's Eve, or Kathleen Mulvernine, under the auspices of Ancient Order of the Hibernian, and Miss Susie McGill, the clever little dancer who appeared at St. Patrick's concert last year. All right, just one more. Hoopman, the Kilties, Canada's greatest concert band appearing in full kilted regimentals back from their world tour of 400,000 miles, 6,000 concerts, feted, honored, and praised by 20 countries, bandmen, singers, piper dancers. This was uh, in 1917 during World War I, and you can see at the bottom there it says Special War Prices. In 1919, the auditorium was turned into a bowling alley. This appeared in October 1919 uh, paper, Times Herald, and it says auditorium to be recreation center of city. Eight bowling alleys are being laid. Billiards should be featured. Plans are being completed for the remodeling of the interior of the auditorium on Broad Street into an immense bowling and billiard parlor which will be open within a short time. The building was recently purchased by David McCarran and W.H. Reed. Well, W.H. Reed was William Reed, and if you remember your history videos, I did several videos on James Reed, his father, who had all the tugboats. It goes on to say, the new enterprise will be known as the Monarch, and will be open to both men and women, and the balcony being used for spectators of the games to be staged in the alley, which, according to Mr. McCarran, will be the finest in the state of Michigan. And then you start to see little blurbs like this one. Monarch Bowling Alleys and Broad Street will be open to the public Monday, November 24th. Come and see a real bowling alley. The best equipped, not in just Port Yarn, but in Michigan. On November 25th, 1919, it was open to the public. Many men and women in attendance for initial rollings. Bow for health, bow for exercise, bow for recreation, bow for real fun, bow for good fellowship, bow because you like it, bow because your friends do. Monarch, bowling, billiards, your club. Nice little ad. In 1928, the alleys were expanded to 14 alleys. And uh, it talks about it here in this article. We looked at this building in videos five and six, basically when it was a high school, but somewhat before that as well. I didn't have all the information I have today, but we did use this picture back then. I didn't realize that the alleys had been expanded, but you can see they put it on the side of their building, 14 alleys. 
but eventually it was sold to the Port Huron School System to be used as a gymnasium for the Port Huron High School uh, when it was on uh, Erie Street. And it got a lot of use, as you can see from this photograph. And eventually it was demolished for the McMoran Complex. But as we zoom in here, you can see the stage area, or what was the stage at one time. Yes, this building has had a rich history. Join me in my next video, and hopefully we'll be able to conclude a series within a series of the theaters of Port Huron.